Welcome to the Indigo Podcast, an exploration of human flourishing at work and beyond. I'm Ben Barron of Indigo Anchor and Cleveland State University. And I'm Chris Everett of Indigo Anchor. For more information, please visit us at www.indigopodcast.com. All right, so today we're talking with Neil Shortland, and we're going to focus on decision-making. That's right. It's going to be a great episode. Thanks so much to prior Indigo podcast guest, Matt Crane, for recommending Neil. This is going to be fantastic. So what are we going to talk about here today, Chris? All right. So, well, we decided to talk about decisions. And we're not going to talk about free will or the biological lack thereof. That's not going to make a cameo. And so we're going to talk about making hard decisions applications to current events like firefighting well, hey we're even going to go there with some policing stuff and business and applications for everyday people yeah and just so people know that we actually have neil on the podcast say hi neil hey everybody how you doing thanks for having me guys thanks uh thanks matt for the recommendation you they may regret it but we'll, we'll see <laughs> we'll see yeah <laughs> thanks so much so let me properly introduce neil because he is one cool guy Neil is an assistant professor of criminology and justice studies and the director of the Center for Terrorism and Security Studies at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. Uh, Neil has a master's in forensic and investigative psychology and a PhD in cognitive psychology from the University of Liverpool. Bef uh, pr prior to joining academia, he was actually a normal person for a while. Uh, he worked in a variety of applied roles alongside the UK police force and UK armed forces. His work generally focuses on the intersection of psychology and security, and he has a special interest in how people make decisions in conditions of high uncertainty. His work on decision-making has incorporated both qualitative and quantitative methods. His book, Conflict, How Soldiers Make Impossible Decisions, was recently published by Oxford University Press. And he has received funding from both the Army Research Institute and National Science Foundation for his experimental research using his decision-making tool, Lucifer, which stands for Least Worst Uncertain Choice Inventory for Emergency Responses. Wow, that's very cool. He applies his work on decision-making to issues of training, selection, and post-event analysis in a range of contexts, from COVID to criminal cases. His latest book, Decisions, Decisions, with Professor Lawrence Allison, is under contract with Penguin Random House and explores how we can overcome fear and procrastination to better seize opportunities in life. Wow. So just a formal welcome, Neil Shortland, to the Indigo podcast. Thank you, yes. guys. Thank you. I, I would have written a shorter bio if I knew you were reading it. So uh, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. No, well, I, maybe I, do less awesome stuff next time, Neil. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah Neil. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, I looked at it and I thought about shortening it, but I just couldn't decide what to cut because like, there's so cool. much good. That's, That's right. freaking cool. Oh, look at that awesome thing. God, my yeah. life stinks next to this guy. <laughs> <laughs> it does. Oh, my so gosh. Fun. So I guess, you know, one place to start, Neil, is with a very basic yet big question of uh, what is a decision and what are your thoughts around that? Um, well, it's, it's an interesting question, actually, because I remember you, you kind of, even when you have to define it, it's one of those things that everyone kind of thinks they understand. But when you actually drill into it, you know, you can kind of get into this kind of this quagmire, if you will, of people really trying to unpack what a decision is. And I think that the the biggest distinction when we talk about what a decision is, is that a lot of people assume that a decision is the process of weighing alternative options and choosing one mm. and often choosing, you know, the best one of the available op of the available options. Right. That's kind of this classic rational approach. But the I think the more accurate description of a de of a decision in general is that a decision is a commitment to a course of action. And I think we'll probably end up unpacking that concept as we go through this. But this idea that it can be a commitment to a course of action, it removes the need for there to be multiple options. And I think that that, that actually opens up what decisions are and it allows them to be all the more encompassing. Um, I think one of the one of the most interesting stories, and it's something I experienced, but but it was reported by psychologists long before, is they would ask people soldiers specifically police officers to talk about decisions and they would turn around and say i've never made a decision and it's like no no no. if you've if you've done something if you've done a course of action making a cup of coffee in the morning turning on the computer that is a decision what people often confuse that with is they've never made choices 
So any action, any choice that results in you doing something, that's a decision. How you get there, that's the decision-making process. Yeah, so, you know, I've also reminded of one of the uh, best rock power trios, Rush, in which one of their songs, they say, if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. Do you agree with that? 100%, 100%. Well, we'll get to that because (laughs) you can choose to not choose, but you can not choose through an attempt to choose. Uh, one of the ones I always love is, uh, oh, it's actually from a, it's a, it's a, it's from a business book. I remember reading it a while ago, but it's kind of, um, the, the idea was uh, four frogs are sitting on a log and three decide to jump. How many frogs are left on the log? And you turn the page and it says four, because there's a difference between deciding and doing. And I think that kind of comes into it as well. You know, a decision to be complete has to result in a behavior. Mm. And that's cool. I think we'll, uh, we can talk about some models that kind of try and unpack that process. But yeah, it's a commitment to a course of action, but ultimately the, the action has to occur or the decision didn't. Yeah, yeah. You know, you also, uh, when we were prepping for this episode, talked about some things like difficulty buttons and so forth. What, what does that have to do with these ideas of a commitment of course of action um, to a course of action being a decision? Well, it, it's interesting because Yates, like there's this old study by Yates where basically he got a bunch of, of undergrad students and he, he asked them to, uh, to, to, to describe hard decisions. And it comes down to this. There's a, I think there's a big kind of, there's a really big, Ar- not argument, but, but difference of opinion in the field about what makes a decision hard. And I think a very, very lay assumption is that the consequences of a decision make it hard. Right. So the bigger the consequences or the bigger the outcome or the more things on the line, the harder the decision. I, I disagree with that. Mm. And, and I think that the evidence for that is in the everyday world. People make unbelievably hard decisions all the time. And not only that, they make decisions with massive implications and massive outcomes. They can make those decisions relatively easily in certain cases. And at the same time, the smallest decisions with the least outcomes sometimes can also be difficult. So I think we have to uncouple the idea that a hard decision is a decision with, with, that naturally just has massive stakes, because I think there are people who can make those decisions very, very easily. And then you get into this kind of this more complex view of kind of what makes decisions hard. And I think if you look at kind of the real world, and I think we reflect on our own lives, you know, some of the difficulty, we call them difficulty buttons, you know, kind of uncertainty, so not knowing what's going on, multiple people being involved. That's another classic one. There's a, one of the, the activities we always do in trainings, uh, myself and, and Lawrence Allison, who I work a lot with, um, uh, and we, we, we use this kind of hypothetical bomb example, right? So imagine you're, you're staring at a bomb. The bomb has two wires, blue and red, right? And you're told that cutting the red wire turns off the bomb. Well, that's not a hard choice, right? Red yeah. wire, bomb. Right? Okay. <laughs> it, it's easy. I wish it was. I'm, I'm sure anyone who defuses bombs wishes it was like this. Right? <laughs> but then you add in two different variables, right? So the first one I'm going to say is cutting the blue wire or the red wire diffuses the bomb. Now, that's made it more uncertain, right? So all we've done there is we've added in uh, task uncertainty. You're not quite sure what the right course of action is. The next step you can take is you can basically say cutting the red wire or the blue wire may or may not diffuse the bomb. So now you have task uncertainty and outcome uncertainty. Now, that immediately makes it incredibly more complicated and incredibly much, much harder. And then what you can do is you can obviously move the bomb to, you know, in research, there was some neuroscience research. We did it where you move the bomb to different places by a school or in a car park, and it, it makes it more complicated. But when it comes to what makes them difficult, what makes decisions difficult, I think it comes down to those two things. What am I meant to do? Or what, what can I do? And what will happen if I do it? And if you can't answer those two questions, you are facing a difficult decision. And, and you got to care, right? Because we've all seen people that flippantly, or you got to have some cognitive resource to understand, be able to frame it that way. Well, I, yeah, 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 right? yeah, I agree. I think, well, one of the things that we well, well, we can get into later on is kind of, you know, how people, when people navigate decisions, right, what makes them difficult is usually the kind of the the clashing or the colliding kind of values that are important to them. So if you go to a decision and you have no stakes in the game, you don't care about any of the outcomes, right? None of the values at play. Well, it's not gonna be a hard decision because you, it's almost a hard decision because you care so little rather than a hard decision because you care so much. So much. So yeah, for a decision to be meaningful and difficult, you have to be 
juggling consequences and outcomes that, that actually matter to you as a person. And that, again, is where you get that kind of individual difference, right? Some people can find a decision phenomenally easy. Some people find the same decision phenomenally hard. It, it's about what that decision is creating in them. And, and I think from a philosophical standpoint, it's no use to science this, but from a philosophical standpoint, my, my belief is that decisions are this immensely phenomenological experience because they, they are an interaction of everything of the person with the situation. And this is what I think like hard decisions, the kind of decisions we'll talk about throughout this, those are the ones that really make you question everything that you've kind of known and everything you bring to the plate. And they're these moments that make you question fundamental truths that you hold dear. That is a, that's a hard decision right yeah. there. And so you have to be invested. Yeah. So why don't we uh, talk a little bit about, you know, there are a lot of different scientific models and ways that decision-making is addressed in the, the scientific literature. And certainly there's uh, a lot of, um, you know, different ways in which the the popular literature likes to uh, talk about decision making. Um, but, but are there any uh, scientific models that you like or that you think are helpful? I mean, so I think the, the one thing about decision making that I like in relation to, I think, a lot of scientific fields is that we I don't think that one theory replaces another. Right? I don't think that you there is a, a all encompassing model. I don't think we as decision making theorists are really operating against each other. I think we're all operating together. Now, there's been movements in the field, right? And I think these reflect truths about human behavior. So the original idea, right, everything's rational and we're, you know, we're economic decision makers and we kind of, you know, we weigh probabilities and we can't, we'll, can't, we calculate costs and all this kind of stuff, right? Um, that was the early move. And then, and then we know kind of like with the, with the move towards real world decisions making study, naturalistic work, Gary Klein's work, that, you know, people in most situations don't do that. We, we kind of cognitive misers, you know, we don't have the wits to do it or whatever they say. Um, but we do a, a more stripped down decision making model, right? This idea that we, um, we kind of look at a situation, we match it to a situation we faced in the past. And then we kind of, you know, we draw on experience, we draw on analogies and we, we decide that way. And that's this this very, very cognitive light model of decision making. I mean, realistically, that's what we want decisions to be. And I know both of you gents have got, you know, your military experience and that's kind of how you're trained, right? So that you recognize situations, you recognize decisions. Now, I personally don't think those two things are against each other. I think there are situations where we, we map out the pros and cons of every course of action, buying a house, buying a car, you know, buying an item, right? Those are what we'd call a multi-attribute decision, right? And then there's the Gary, the Gary Klein ones, right? The, the kind of the, the recognition prime routine, you know, now, pattern matching decision. Now, say what recognition decisions. prime is. For oh, sorry. Listeners. So recognition prime decision making is the, is the theory that basically decisions are made by recognizing a pattern which primes an action, right? So, so an, an analogy I would, I would use, right? It's, it's a terrible analogy. Uh, it's a sports analogy, which is not my forte. Um, if, I'm, if I'm playing golf, and I'm 150 yards from the green, right? I pull the same club every single time, right? Because I get up there, I recognize the pattern, I don't make a decision, I know what to do, right? The same thing if you're an army officer, if you're a police officer, if you're a fire officer, you recognize the situation, you have a primed, locked and loaded response ready. Does it work? Yes, apply it. So instead of doing multiple courses of action, instead of thinking, shall I do A, B, C, or D, you think, right, this situation calls for A. Last time I faced this situation, I did A. Can I do A? Yes, right, let's do A. So it's, it's a single model, right? Now, where I studied decision making is actually slightly different to that. And it's because we kind of, I've always said, you know, like Gary Klein can have 95% of decisions. Gary Klein can have 99% of decisions. I have a little 1% over here, right? <laughs> it's these decisions called uh, least worst decisions, which are these situations that we face where they're novel, you haven't really faced them before, they don't perfectly match your training, and you are presented with two courses of action, right? And those, you have no idea, one, which course of action is better, because both could be bad, both could be good. And two, you don't really have any experience to help you of this specific situation. So, if we take my little area, right, my little 1%, these, these high stakes, unique, novel, 
least worst decisions. There are, I think, three theories that we need to, I think, hold in our minds in order to kind of understand this little area, right? And the first is what, uh, it's Lipschitz and Strauss. They basically call it the trimodal model of decision making. And what they basically said, and it links to that definition I gave you earlier, right? This, this idea that there are, that a decision is a commitment to a course of action. But that means that based on your commitment, as in how much you already think you know what you're going to do, a decision can be experienced very, very differently. And they basically say there are three different types. One is where you have, you're basically, you know what you're going to do because other things are telling you what to do, right? You know that you, um, you know your choice because policy tells you, because all of a social norm tells you. Right. So if you're a if you're a soldier, if you're a police officer right, and, and a certain action happens, there is a policy that tells you if this happens, you will do a right. That is the first kind of decision. You don't actually have to think. You just almost defer your decision to the policy, to the law, to the social norm. And that's how you 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 guide your action. The second is is what he called reassessment, which is you you basically come to a decision already knowing what you want to do. Because you're, you're already committed to it. In this situation, I do this, right? That's, it's basically recognition prime, right? So the question isn't, what do I do? The question is, I want to do this. Is there any reason I shouldn't, right? Wake up in the morning, go to the kettle. I want to make a cup of coffee. I do it every single morning. Is there any reason that today I shouldn't make a cup of coffee, right? That's what you have to almost convince yourself not to make the decision you want to make. And then the last kind, so try three different forms. The last kind of decision is the really, the fun one, is what he calls choice, which is where you have no previous commitment to, and there are two options in front of you. So you don't know, you, you don't know if you want to do A or B, you're equally attracted or unattracted to both. You have no experience to help you, and there's no policy to dictate. Now you're facing a decision because the thing about choice is that in choosing A, you sacrifice B. In choosing B, you sacrifice A. That is, that is where the psychology comes in because not only do you have to convince yourself that you want A, you have to convince yourself that you don't want anything associated with B. So, so the, the big meaty one that's at the heart of most difficult decisions is choice. Pre two options and you have no commitment to either. The second theory uh, I'll, I'll try and make the theory slightly shorter than the last one. Now, the second theory is one called, uh, it's called the safe T model. And it was designed by uh, Lawrence Allison, Claudia van den Heuvel back in 2012. Now, it's, it's, it's basically a, a phase-based model of how you make decisions, right? So, so the idea is simply, right, situational awareness, what's going on? Plan formulation, what can I do? Plan execution, let's go do it. Team learning, what did we learn? Right? That, that's not the innovation. Right? They, they basically looked at how people make decisions and built the model. But what the safety model does, and then it comes down to your point earlier, is it identifies the ways in which you can fall off the rails when making a decision. Now, it was around 2003, and a guy called Anderson wrote a paper called The Psychology of Doing Nothing. And basically, he said that we're phenomenal at studying decisions, right? how people make decisions. We are really bad at studying how people don't make decisions and how people <laughs> fail to make decisions. And so the safety model kind of tries to explain that. And so basically it says you've got situational awareness. And then the next link is plan formulation. Well, if you miss the link, you basically get into what they call decision avoidance, which is I know there's a decision I need to be made. I'm just going to avoid it. OK, you get plan formulation. So I'm, I'm deciding what to do. If you never get to plan execution, you're in what they call redundant deliberation, which is you can't work out what you want to do. You can't choose between A and B. And it's not avoidance because you're not hiding from it. You're really working hard to choose and you just can't do it. And then you get to the last one, which is you can choose A or B, and then you can just not actually do it. And that's what they call kind of um, implementation failure. Now, a kind of an example of this, I mean, I always give it to my students is, a really simple example is imagine someone's in a relationship and it can be a relationship with uh, an employer. It can be a relationship with a partner. Right. And they start to, to feel that they're not happy or they start to feel that there are, you know, there are uh, uh, problems, things that they're not happy with. Right. They can avoid that. They can avoid the decision of what should I do? And they can just 
press it down and, and live in their lives. I'm going to have and, resentment instead yeah, exactly. of decision making. I'm just going to, I'm just going <laughs> to happily sit here mad at the world. They can embrace the fact that they need to make a decision and they can spend, they can try and work out what do I do? Do I find another job? Do I stay in this job? Do I break up with my partner? Do I stay with my partner? And they can be deciding that for a week, a month, a year, a decade, a lifetime, right? That's, that's redundant deliberation. You can just go back and forth. It can change by day. It can change by minute. It can change by hour, right? But you can also decide. You can decide that I'm unhappy in my job and I want to leave, but you can never actually walk into the office and hand in your resignation. That is implementation failure. So the safety model's innovation is not that it tells you how people make decisions. That isn't really new knowledge there, but it shows you there's these three different ways that you can all fail to make a decision. And each one is actually a different, it's a different psychological process and it kind of has different elements associated with it. But all of them result in the same thing, which is you never do, you never make a decision. Yeah. And the last one, and it's not even a theory, really, it's just more of a concept that I, I just love to remind people. And basically it's this, this argument that the, there is a kind of an arms race for energy going on in the body. And the brain, our, our cognitive muscle working to make decisions, the more complicated the decision, the harder the brain needs to work. But what that means is that the less blood the brain has or the less nutrients or the less like the, the harder it's going to or the worse it's going to be in terms of making decisions. And that's I think that's really important because if you look at everyday decisions, you know, yeah, I like it. if you look at everyday decisions and people are hungry, hot hungover, sleep deprived, right? That's drawing away energy. But if you look at some of the decisions, you know, I know that you gents have faced there, the kind of decisions I study with soldiers. You know, if you look at the fight or flight response, by design, that moves all of the blood to the big muscles, to the arms and the legs, the dinosaur fighters right there. Mm -hmm. Because back in evolutionary times, you didn't need advanced complex cognitive processes to right. fight a dinosaur, you had to run. <laughs> but what's interesting is that then when we take soldiers or we take police officers or we take firefighters or you know government officials under stress and we put them in stressful fight or flight situations, all of the blood is going to move to the big to the big muscles. And then we ask them to make you know, very, very complex cognitive ruminations. We ask the most of them cognitively, while at the same point, they are in a state where they have the least resources to go with. And so I kind of, all of those combine to me, those, those three theories, they need to come as one because true hard decisions present as a choice. There are, the safety tells us how, the many ways people are going to try and avoid it. And, and let's be clear, the, 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 re the, the instant reaction is to try and avoid a difficult decision, right? We love avoidance, <laughs> right? So if there's a choice in front of us, our first thought is how can we avoid it? And if we can't avoid it, here's how we get stuck. And then the arms race is just this idea that we need to, I think sometimes we just need to respect the fact that the body is, a, is, a, is, a, is an organism and we put people in situations where they're not equipped to make unbelievably cognitively complex advanced decisions there's an army study a while ago about they were getting annoyed basically that soldiers in operations were getting tunnel vision and not innovating and not adapting and not being you know responsive and adaptive and it's like well why do you think that is do you think maybe it's the fact that they're sleep deprived hungry and carrying 80 yeah. 80 pounds on let, their back let me put a gun I mean, to I, your I, head I, yeah. buddy and have you do a painting for me and it needs to beat monet uh, exactly. all right let's go i'm <laughs> racking the slide i got my glock right here let's go you be creative you numbskull study designer what <laughs> the <laughs> heck guys this is the kind of crap god i gotta do push-ups for a second i'm so mad i'm you gonna I'm, I'm gonna tell you Can I <laughs> Can I tell you my favorite study? I, I don't know if you, this isn't this is favorite theory, but I'm just gonna I'm gonna pivot me over to favorite Go study. Go for it. 2001. I don't know if ethically <laughs> they were allowed to do it then and not now. There's this study on the Norwegian military, right, where they take these sleep deprived uh, cadets who had done like a four or five day exercise, and what they do is they sub the bullets in their guns for blanks, and then they sub the um, the cut out people down on the driving range for real people. Oh and then God. they basically go, right, guys, come on, we're going to go do our like shooting mission. 
Uh, and so they go down there and these guys think they're firing real bullets at fake targets. And in truth, they're firing fake bullets at real targets. Right. And so they go down there and the, the people start moving. What I'll ask you this one, Chris and Ben. Right. What percentage of soldiers do you think shot? So fired, they fired what they thought was a real bullet at a moving target that should have been stationary. 10%. I don't think they, um, I don't know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't shoot. <laughs> 60%. 60%. 60%. Yeah. And I'm not, and I'm not blaming them. They, they put, I think some yeah. of the interviews said they kind of thought they were hallucinating. They weren't really sure. Well, but, and, uh, well and they had the authority to people, exactly. right? There's that whole yeah. thing, and, like and go ahead and shock right. the man type yeah. thing. And they were sleep deprived, right? Yeah, exactly. To your point about the cognitive resources that are being drained in that moment, right? I'm exactly. not sleep deprived right now. So, you know, well, they should have made them all have kids first. <laughs> and then they're like, you know, actually, I'm getting more sleep in the army than I did is with the infant. <laughs> but, but <this> is the <laughs> I'm already thing. trained for this. <laughs> but when, when we talk about decisions, right, it, it, it's always in the extremes, right, when you look at soldiers. You know, the right, sleep yeah. deprivation they go through, the, the load they carry, yep. the, the nutritional aspects. It's always in the extremes over there. But you take that down to a, uh, a business level decision. And it's like you, your decision making can be really negatively impacted by you having a few hours less sleep, you know, you having, you know, not eating properly, you making de decisions before lunch versus after lunch. And it's just an awareness that decision making and how that process works is governed physiologically as much as psychologically. And one of the things that I feel we see a lot is people assume a, a psychological independence from physiological independence. They view this double dissociation. It doesn't matter what you're doing in the real world, what the situation is, your brain should be working almost in a vacuum. And the reason I kind of get to like the arms race just as, as a concept is that, that they're, they're two combined things. You know, they're two combined things. The same way you'd say, you know, never go take a test for, never go take a college test hungover and hungry, right? Or don't get people to go make extreme complex decisions while they're, you know, physiologically depleted, or at least if they are physiologically depleted, appreciate that when yeah. you try and understand the decisions that they made and why they, you know, they operated in certain ways. So it's, it, that to me, it's just such a, a fundamental concept that's so often forgotten, this idea that the body really dictates our behavior first. Yeah, yeah. No, that's phenomenal. Hey, what one question that I had that I was just thinking about as you were describing this, is I'm curious to know what you kind of think about the idea of intuition and, you know, the uh, gut feelings. I'm thinking of um, Gerd uh, Gigerenzer's work. He wrote a book called mm. Gut Feelings, talking about, you know, the, the, the role of intuition, how it actually can be helpful in certain circumstances, that kind of thing. And I don't know if that ties it, but maybe that goes directly back to the recognition prime model or um, something else. But what, what, are, what are your thoughts about the, the role of in intuition in making decisions? Well, I think, I think it's a really interesting point. Now, I definitely think, um, so in terms of Gerd's work with kind of, with the recognition prime stuff, yeah, I mean, I 100% think that, you know, you can not cognitively process a full situation and yet react. And I think that that actually, you know, that probably helps with some of these decisions that are, you know, meant to be super quick. You know, a lot of decision making is about time, right? And a lot of the the high stakes decision making, especially in an operational environment, it's about making decisions quickly, quickly and lightly. Right. Um, but I would never dismiss intuition um, in any part of the decision making process. You know, when we look at choices, right? And, and it's something I think we'll probably, I think we can we can touch on later. But one of the things we talk about, you know, when you're making a choice, is that you kind of need to prioritize your own values, right? You need to pick, right? A is super important to me and it is more important than B. I think that sometimes you can't cognitively um, articulate why that is. And that I think is where you're getting to the same thing of intuition. You know, it's this old fMRI study um, where they ask people to, you know, describe their perfect loved one, right? What are the, va what are the variables you look for in a, in a partner? And then they showed people all of these pictures or pictures and profiles or whatever it was. And then they came out and they said, right, who was, you know, who was the, the partner that you, you know, you thought you liked the most or whatever it was. And the brain, the reaction the of the ones. brain, the hot they one. Yeah. the hot one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was all, all college-aged men. Um, <laughs> the reaction of the brain was a better indicator of their choice than what they said before. Hmm. And I always think that it's just, an, it's just an example of there's this, you know, underneath everything, there's often this kind of unconscious processing going on that you're not that really that aware of. And then... When you make a decision, you afterwards, you kind of come up with all of the justifications. And I think in decisions, you have the exact same thing. I have myself made decisions where I can't articulate, articulate to you why I'm so committed to doing A. 
and why I'm going to always do A instead of B. But however, I'm going to go with it. Now, the problem is that that can go both ways because your intuition can guide you perfectly towards A. But at the same point, some of these unconscious processes and intuitions, they can make you, guide you towards A, but, but you know, A isn't, isn't right. I, I can give you a, I mean, one of the examples I would go with is one of the soldiers I interviewed um, for the book a while ago. He, he described to me what he calls the worst decision he's ever made. And it was, um, they, were, they were out at this uh, forward operating base, constantly receiving fire from uh, basically a, a group of Taliban soldiers out in the in the kind of a, a woodland area basically just constantly not annoying but constantly just firing on the base and it was really getting to him it was getting to him it was getting to his troops and one day i think it was a, a special forces guy came in and was like right we've got intel we've got we can see them um with the with the art with the with the some of the intelligence materials we've got we think we've got their base what do you want to do and he was like right 100 percent, launch a strike and so he launches this strike and, you know, he said he's watching the whole mountain be kind of, you know, lit up. Uh, and he gets a call from his commanding officer and his commanding officer's like, hiya, uh, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm bombing, I'm bombing the Taliban. You know, we found them. <laughs> uh, you know, there was this movement. I, I, I interpreted it. I think it's their base. You know, they're moving late at night. Missions ago. And the commanding officer said, did you not think for a second that that could be a bunch of men cutting wood? And he was like. No. And he said that whole moment just drained everything out of him, realized basically pure, like cognitive closure. All of his intuitions led him down this path to, to commitment to this action. And only when someone told him afterwards did he realize, you know, um, that, that he basically just, just followed this gut intuition of I'm annoyed. I want them. You know, I really want to get these guys. And that just led him down this path. And he's he, I'm, like, this isn't my interpretation. He's open about this. He says, you know, worst decision I've ever made. He, he told me he almost resigned because of it. You know, the, in the end, they went and did a battle damage assessment. And it actually was the it was the Taliban. He actually got them. But he was so upset in his own process that, you know, he told me he um, he did, you know, courses afterwards and just like studied his own personality, studied his own decision making all to try and work out how he'd got it so wrong in this wow. in this one decision. So I don't take intuition out of anything. I think it can be sometimes we, we can't explain why we're committed to something. At the same time, sometimes we can follow intuition, you know, too far. And, and we can get to expertise later and kind of talk about how some of these uh, things we can try and overcome. But intuition, I'm, I'm a big believer that we are unconscious processes first and conscious processes second. You know, some of the most important lectures I ever had as an undergrad, we're about this idea of the literally the illusion of consciousness. And I, Chris was earlier like, we're not going into free will. I'm going right, to try and take <laughs> us there. But no, it's this idea that, you know, a lot of conscious experience is a confabulation of the brain. We, we create, you know, we create conscious control and often we do it after we follow our unconscious impulses. And so I don't think you can take it out of decisions. I think it, it operates in all of them. In choices, it's going to it could it's going to guide us a and b and then you know like you're mentioning earlier you know in in recognition crime and gut instinct it's going to guide us you know in certain in certain directions and i normally i think intuition is correct because i think you know the unconscious processing has much more power than the conscious processing right but let's, let's throw something in on that all right so mate selection right let's say mm -hmm. you grew up in a bad family and you keep making these bad bad decisions i had a girlfriend of mine who's like i know this guy's horrible but i i just can't help myself saying those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So maybe if you really wanted to commit, you'd have to say, I'm going to have these people select my spouse from a country that allows arranged marriages, and I'm just going to go with it. Now, I, you, if you commit to that kind of process, it's probably not going to feel like, man, this is such a sexy marriage. Gosh, it's so great. Every day's yippity skippity. But maybe your heart could come around to it on the other end. Let's take a look at a policy decision. If we know that we're flooded, like the day after 9-11, if mm -hmm. Bush wants to be, it's time to make some glass, he caught, probably could have turned some square footage into glass overseas in that moment. And the country would have been with him. Mm -hmm. But instead, we went through several years, you know, like, why did it take us so long to get to Iraq? Man, planning a whole country invasion takes some mission, mission planning, right? But if we know, but instead, we did get massive new bureaucracy with uh, all the Homeland Security stuff that got set up. So, you know, one of the ways we could do a process to prevent, you know, deal with our fact that our mind get hijacked is we have to say only a supermajority can do anything after a 9-11 event. 
and we give ourselves a year to cool down and then mm -hmm. we're deciding in a different space, right? Well, I, I think one of the points about that, Chris, that I, I really like is, is that I think a lot of, I, I think a lot of the things we do in life are designed to stop us, to, to avoid the need to make decisions, right? And I, and, okay, so going back to trimodal, trimodal there's, choice is really the tough one and we don't want them. Like I don't want to spend all of my day having to make choices because they're tiring and they're tough and I have to convince myself and it makes me work hard and I don't have any guidance. I don't want choices. I want an easy life. I want a life where I either know what I'm going to do or someone's telling me what I want to do. And literally, we design all of our systems to avoid us from having to make choices. The reason we train you know, people with rehearsal, mission rehearsal, right. is like Mike Matthews calls it, a library of experiences. So you never face a situation you haven't already faced. Because if you've already faced it, you know what to do. Why do we fill organizations, military and business organizations, with policy? So people don't have to make choices because there's a policy to tell you what you want to do. And I think there's a, 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 there's a, there's a, there's a psychological benefit of not making choices. And, and again, where, where do you want to go with that? You want to go to Milgram with it? You want to go to anything else with it? But it's deferring autonomy. I didn't decide. The policy decided. I didn't decide. I was trained to do this. And you're deferring you know, your responsibility because when you make a choice, you chose A. You chose B, right? That was you. And we, I think it's humans, we don't, we don't really like that. Well, uh, well, so, yeah, let me interject on that a little things. bit. So yeah. we know, like in the army, we make an SOP, right? Mm -hmm. Every unit that rolls out infantry has mm -hmm. a different SOP. And so like we make those, deci those clutch decisions and those narrow, you know, you're emotionally flooded, your vision goes small. Mm -hmm. And then we, we review them and we say, you know what? I, I made a numbskull decision. And then you make that process right there. It's a way of triaging your own biology, right? Do you mean it's, so it's, not, it's not like you don't, because as, as an infantry person, I don't want to roll out with somebody else's SOP, mm -hmm. right? Because that's the team dynamic that we have. You know, matter of fact, resent it a little bit if an SOP I don't agree with comes down, right? Yeah. But that, that there, I mean, what you've got there, it sounds like is you kind of got, you've got your, you've got your situational awareness as a group. And then you have come up with your kind of as a group based decision making, you have agreed on what the correct decision should be. So you've still developed a guideline, but obviously your guideline is unique to you and unique to your team and unique to how you operate. And I know right. this is something that we discussed before, this idea of kind of, well, then when you leave and new people come in and their interpretation of a situation might be completely different, which means their SOP is going to be completely different. And yeah, so that's what, what, what I'm saying this. is like, it's, it's this idea of, hey, I don't know how to necessarily do mi nationwide mission planning. So I'm going to have some experts think about this. So I don't make an either uninformed decision mm -hmm. or an emotional decision. Right. Like, like, what would you tell to somebody who keeps picking the wrong mate based on some kind of emotional wiring yet wants to be in a relationship with somebody? Like, I mean, some version of Ooh, somebody else that. decides. <laughs> and but you're deciding to submit yourself to that, right? I, I see. I see what you're saying there. Yeah, I, I think that there is something to be said for identifying or self-reflecting on what your own faults are, and then deferring to kind of somebody else to make that decision for you, right? But right. I think that the the problem is well, one problem I think you'd have would be investment. So I think that if you if you fully defer everything, and then, it's, okay, so if you go to a, it's an interesting point, if you go to some of our other work, and I like this is very unrelated, is on, um, is on uh, kind of how interpersonal interaction, right? And what you basically get to is the fundamental essence of human behavior is autonomy. And so if you look at studies where they put monkeys in cages versus studies where the dog walk, uh, sorry, where the monkey goes into the cage itself, they're both, they're both in, they're in the same cage. Their reaction is so much more distressed and so much more emotional if they've been put in the cage. And it's because they didn't have the autonomy right. to choose their outcome. I have the same thing. I've got a, a puppy here. I have to try and make the puppy think that it chose to go to the pen to go to bed. Because if I pick <laughs> him up and put him in the pen to go to bed, he's not going to sleep for two hours. So I do think that when it comes to decisions, it's this interesting balance. I literally realize I've contradicted myself. But no, there's this interesting 
there's this fundamental kind of challenge there of we like feeling like we have autonomy. Like we like to feel that we choose things. We don't like our lives being chosen for us. But at the same point, we also really don't actually like making choices that often because it is all on us. And I think that comes down, I mean, the difference there is going to be this idea of accountability, right? How accountable are you going to be for your actions? Now, with your relationship dilemma or relationship example, what are the what are the costs of repeated failed relationships? I mean, not that. I mean, if you, if you talk do, to a lot of my guy friends, all of they're your completely life. broke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a, there can be a big fiscal cost. But it's not, it's not the same degree of accountability as, you know, if you make a decision in a job related realm and the accountability is, you know, termination of service or the lives of others and things. Mm. So I think it, that's probably a nuance there in terms of like, we can go and make poor personal decisions routinely. And if the consequences aren't as drastic and as real, it's probably you're more likely to continue the behavior. I think in an employment-based world where the accountability and the outcomes is so high, that's where things get a lot more murky, I think, and a lot more kind of, I think that's where probably more likely to, to embrace avoidance. And I think as a business, you've got to think about this. So one of the things I think about SOP specifically is businesses have okay let's go to the afghan let's go to the afghan war right mm -hmm. the they have a national uh war strategy if you will which is this is how we want the war to go right and mccrystal can come in and he can literally change the whole strategy from you know i want all decisions to be around hunting insurgents and you know a, a counter-terrorism operation to i want all decisions to reflect a fundamental respect for the civilian population and counterinsurgency principles so that is supposed to bleed its way down through all decisions that are made, all the way down to the, 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 the everyday patrol. Any decision you make down on patrol should reflect this overarching, you know, General Stanley McChrystal's one decision that he made at the top. But the problem that you have, and this is like what you were talking about, Chris, is on the, on the ground level, you also have made decisions and are making decisions about how you think it's best to operate. So you have to balance bottom up decision making where you're benefiting from your experiences, how you know your group works, how you know your village works, how you know you can achieve the things you need to do. And this top level directive of we need everything to kind of in unity, all be in accord with this overarching decision that we've made. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And uh, there, there's definitely um, plenty of room there for uh disagreement and for misalignment and and everything in between so um you know one thing we had talked about and i think it'd be interesting to explore a little bit too in terms of hard decisions out there are some of the decisions that have to get made in uh for example police and the fire service and those types of arenas um what are some things maybe that you uh you have seen or maybe some of these ideas that we can apply to those situations i mean i think if you look at the most i think the 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 clear decision that we're seeing, I mean, at least that is at the forefront of the public consciousness, right, is this kind of, I think, this use of force decision. Mm. And I think there's, I mean, so as a, as, a, as a UK person, you know, obviously, this is not something that I've grown up surrounded by. But I mean, since being in America now, eight years, you know, it's, it's a pretty constant source of, of discussion. And when, whenever you tell anyone you study decisions, one of the ones that they bring to the fore almost is, you know, this, well, what do you think about, you know, police shootings and police use of force? Now, I think studying it or looking at it externally, I think the, the first point that I would make is that when it comes to high uncertainty decision making, you do have to be able to separate process from outcome. There's the, I mean, these origin, orig the original work in, uh, I think it was 1998, uh, Erasmu or Erasmu, 1998, studied the NASA pilots. And she, she wrote it in a paper she wrote there, you know, when it comes to, you know, these kind of decisions, good, good outcomes are as much about luck as they are about good decision making. Right. And, and uh, right. And this comes, down, it's at and least. People right. judge on that all the time in politics. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, that president had a bad outcome. Well, what if his decisions were between, bad horrible and gosh darn awful exactly and also you know, yeah he doesn't know and this, this is this is why least worst decisions are least worst and we all face them you don't know what happens if you do a if you do a okay let's go with a police shooting example right so 
One option is that you, and I'm going to, I'm going to strip down the decision to a binary, use force, don't use force. I think the more complicated argument here is actually there are alternative courses of act. Potentially, could there be alternative courses of action that don't make it this binary decision? I think that's a, that's actually the, the, the discussion that should be had. But let's go with it's a binary decision, right? If you choose to shoot, there are two options. One, you saved your life and the life of your fellow police officers because the person was going to do violence. Option two, the person was not going to do violence and you have harmed and hurt a civilian who, had, who posed no threat of harm. They are two realistic outcomes if you choose option A. If you choose option B, the, uh, the outcomes are either A, that uh, so option B being don't do anything, A, that you are harmed and your fellow troops are har- your fellow uh, officers are harmed, or B, that no harm comes to anybody and the individual was not going to do any harm anyway, and everything's okay. And that, that manifests in the police, but I've studied that in the military. I've interviewed tons of soldiers who have faced very, very similar decisions when operating out as part of the civilian population, right? This basically, I don't know what's going to happen, what this person could do. They could do something very, very harmful. This could be something completely benign, and I don't know. Yeah, people so they have don't to make a frame. That, that framing you did of that decision criteria, when I talk to people about this stuff all the time, because I, oh, you're in the army, weigh yep. in on this. They don't even frame it that way. Well, let's just lay the options out. Yep. Is it, and, is and it, structurally, exactly structurally, if you had to play the odds, like I never want to gamble against the house. That's why I think I went to Vegas once. I thought it was, gosh, this is ridiculous. You know, <laughs> they're like, oh, the table's hot. Well, statistics aren't hot or cold, buddy. And yeah. so, but when you look at the decision, it's structurally biased towards a violent outcome. It is because you're juggling. Okay, it 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 gets down to I think a very very sacred value, and I mean this this you, it, this is something that the fully needs to be unpacked. And um, I mean we could talk about it, I think from an organizational standpoint, if an organization has a has a decision that is repeatedly being made that is you know is 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 having negative and bad outcomes, they need to break down the decision and say what are the two values at play here. And if you look at the police decision at the moment. One value is protecting the, the police officer themselves, and one value is protecting the civilian population. You cannot have both at the same time. You can have 60 40 of one or the other. But at some point, you need to put a policy but in at place. At the end of the day, I want to go home. I want to go home. I may lose my job and reprimand, but I don't want to die and not see my kid that year. I, no, I agree with you. There, there's, a, there's a psychological theory called error management theory, which is we're just biased to avoid the most costly error. And often the most costly error is something that harms and murders ourselves. Because think and, of the I mean, value it's, 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 you'd it's have to take. Truth, think of the is. value you'd have to take. Well, today, I'm, I'm just going to get shot today, maybe, to get a friendlier picture for police enforcement. <laughs> right? Today, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to do the sacrifice. I mean, if you're in a firefight with your team in Afghanistan, you might be like, I've got to go get those my buddies who are mm-hmm. bleeding out over there and I'm going to run across this field getting shot at. And, and you're like, you know what? I may just freaking die and I'm just going to do it. I'm going to take that risk. But when you got to go day in and day out, 20, 30 year career as a police officer, you can't have that mindset of, oh, I'm just going to never pull out my gun ever because like, that's ridiculous, right? I agree. But the, but the thing is, if you look at the, so when you're, the, the, that decision itself is a phenomenally difficult decision. Now, what it means is that someone can make the very, very best decision that they can right. in a very, very horrible, high uncertainty, awful situation, right? And they can have a good outcome or a bad outcome. They can take, you know, they can use offensive force and the person can oppose the threat and they can save everyone's life. At the same point, they can use offensive force and they can, they can get it wrong. But the decision they made was the best possible decision in terms of a process. At the same time, also, someone can make a very bad decision in terms of process, and they can, ju- they can choose the same outcome, but they've got there through a, a bad uh, uh, kind of decision-making process where you know, they misinterpreted the situation or they just generally just did the wrong thing for the wrong reasons. You know, some of the military cases we've seen, I did um, some, some work on the, uh, there was a documentary on the Clint Lawrence case, which you know, was, uh, got a lot of press last year. That was, a, that was a bad decision by all accounts, right? He made people do the bad decision. So you've got a process which can be good or bad, and you've got an outcome that can be good or bad, and they aren't perfectly correlated. 
Right. Now, the problem that I'm seeing is that we are judging on outcomes and not judging on processes. And I mean, you, I think a lot of it comes down to almost maybe maybe it's something as simple as fundamental attribution error, right? Mm -hmm. When we make our own errors, we blame our environment. When someone else makes an error, we blame the person. But I think that there needs to be a, a we can't constantly assume that a bad outcome is and is indicative of a bad decision-making process. And we definitely can't avoid investigating the process. And I think what we're seeing at the moment is that I think people are, are very quick to infer process from outcome. And so just as a decision-making person, decision-making researcher, I would always argue that, you know, we, we need to investigate the process. And this is something that, I mean, I've been doing this um, more recently, actually, but I've been doing some work on, on, on criminal cases, on murder charges. Where people, you know, look at the, the individual on trial and they're going for, you know, murder one and they're saying this is premeditated, uh, premeditated murder. I've, um, I've done some kind of gang work in the past and things like that. And it's like, no, no, you need to look at this person's process and assess when they made their decision, what was going through their mind, what their courses of action were, how they perceived the situation. And did they make the best, albeit awful, but the best decision that they could? Or did they make a terrible decision, in which case they should be fully culpable for their actions? And so I think that from the, the, the problem is that that process question is so tough and you can get protective on one side or the other. But it, it is but what it comes is down to. But this is policy issues, too. It, it's policy. It's everything. Every time you go overseas with the government, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, oh, well, America just goes and screws up every country it went into. Right. They're, they're looking at outcomes. Right. Mm -hmm. Versus maybe not the decision process. They're like they're not familiar with the complexity of policy and different things that that go in there. But it's another thing as well. And I think that people I, I, it's, just, it's a simple activity. But I think that mapping decisions out in terms of the least worst outcomes from both options. It just it shows you how complicated these decisions are. One of the, if we're going to talk about kind of a policy making decision, I think a really interesting one would be kind of intervention in Syria. You know, actually the one that, if anything, was kind of the, 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 the decision not to intervene. Now, you map that out, right? So you've got this emerging, um, you've got this emerging kind of uh, group uh, of kind of, you know, Al-Qaeda affiliates, Al-Qaeda and Iraq affiliates breaking off, kind of beginning to operate. And the question is, do we go in, you know, do we operate militarily or do we not operate militarily? Well, let's say you operate militarily, right? What are the outcomes? Outcome one, great outcome. You put them down, there's no more issues, and you've, you've controlled kind of or minimized the amount of harm that's being caused in that area. Other outcome, you recreate or redo the early, you know, 1998, you know, Af uh, Afghan intervention in which you go yeah. in and kind of make things worse or, you know, Al you know um, Iraq 2003, right? You go in and you almost create the problem that you went in there to solve, and then right. the, they get more support from the civilian population, and they get bigger, and they get more powerful, and you've created that, right? So acting militarily, one great outcome, one awful outcome. Let's not act now. Well, not act, good outcome, nothing really happens. You know, they go away, or, you know, there's infighting and they fall apart, and you don't really have to worry about it in a year. Not act, not out, not acting, outcome number two, they grow into a massive uh, terrorist organization that inspires terrorist attacks all over the world and establishes a physical stronghold and a caliphate. Now, it's very easy to look at that outcome and say, well, that was terrible decision-making processes. But you don't know that if, you hadn't, if we hadn't chosen, if Obama hadn't chosen the other outcome, that it wouldn't have created an equal negative situation. Yeah. And so I think in most policy decisions, I mean, this is why, you know, I, I personally don't want to be president, but most policy decisions are least worse. And, you know, if you look at, I think, I think a really interesting, and this actually, I think, Matt, this maps onto to what Matt spoke about in your last episode, right, is when people are making least worse decisions, and I think it's something we can, we, can, we can go to in a bit, I think, to talk about how people make them. But one of the biggest guiding principles is going to be kind of people's value systems, which is linked to their personality. And so it's interesting to see Obama's handling versus Trump's handling, right? Obama famously established a red line in Syria, and when it was crossed, didn't really operate militarily or take a, a quantifiably large military intervention. Trump 
on the other hand, have been very militarily orientated when it comes to movements and the use of chemical weapons, you know, in Syria and in Iraq. Now, I'm not saying either of those decisions are better than the other. I'm not saying one made a better decision making process than the other. What I think is probably true is that both faced least worst decisions. They both went with their value systems and they both came to different outcomes. And it is luck and time that will tell us in hindsight who made better decisions. But, but the problem is that when we look at when, when, we are, when we have a responsibility to investigate how people make decisions, it's very, very easy to get distracted by outcomes at the cost of really investigating their process because their process is done on faith of what the outcomes will be. And that, yeah, I say that in I don't, I don't know what ESPN would have a business model. If they, you know, because everything's about, well, and you get like some lay numbskull, you know, sitting on their couch calling in. Hey, I just want to call in about that call. What was that coach thinking? That guy's a big dummy. You know, we would would have won the game. And like, dude, he's got the position of coach. What do you got? You got the beer yep. drinker at home? Like, <laughs> yeah. and and it's it's that kind of thing. And we have so much, and social media drives a lot of this. Mm-hmm. You know, let's go find out from Joe Listener on the street. Hey, what do you think about that? Well, wait, does this guy have any expertise in this kind of stuff? What, Again, what is it, going on? It it, it it's outcome orientated. You know, and it's it's outcome orientated on steroids, probably with a bit of fundamental attribution error and the human <laughs> tendency to assume we would have done it better. Mm-hmm. And so you put all of those things in and you can get, a, you know, it, it's not nice to have your decisions, you know, investigated and questioned by the, the wider population. Because firstly, least worst decisions usually create a 50-50 split anyway. So 50% of people disagree with you. And then if it has a bad outcome, then that 50% is now, you know, give, is given some view of support that they were right all along. And it, it's one of those problems. But it's interesting because when we look at organizational decision making, police decision making, military decision making, you know, a lot of this stuff, people start to think about this. They start to think about um, this idea of what are people going to say about the decision I made? Not, is the decision I made the best possible chance I've got to do the best thing? right? It's what are people going to say if I do this? And what are people going to say if I do this? That's not where you want people to be. You don't want people in, in high stakes situations making decisions on how do I think people are going to judge the decision I made? You want people to make decisions on how can I save the most lives? How can I do the most good? How can I protect the most people? There's a paper. Again, I'm going to bring in my second favorite paper now, but the, the safety paper that I mentioned earlier, right? The title mm-hmm. is called How Accountability and uncertainty derail strategic save life decisions. And that's what they found. When people were in uncertainty and feeling highly accountable, as in what's going to happen to me, they stopped thinking about what decision protects the population, what decision brings the best good to this. They started thinking, what decision is the most defensible if it's wrong in the morning? What decision doesn't put me on the front page headlines of the newspapers? Yeah, we've seen that in the army. Well, you know, when we roll outside 100%. the wire, everybody, hey, well, I'm just going to c- pump all this decision up, up, up. And then it's, mm-hmm. uh, is it your fault? One, two, three, not it, you know, like, and nobody's focused on, you know, what's the benefit or take a look in organizations, the budgeting process. So, so um, you report to me, Neil. And, and so I say, hey, Neil, listen, your, your budget was $2 million last year for your section. And um, I'd like to get. more work out of you for 25% less. So I'm trying to get the most work for the least amount of money, right? And then what do you say to me? You say, oh, well, gee, I want to actually get more money for less work. But what's missing here is like, how's this going to help us win in the business space, right? Nobody has the, the whole budget process sets up a decision-making that's about deal-making between individuals rather than pushing the organization strategically forward. No, I, I 100% agree. But that's the thing. If people are in an organizational culture, I think incentives and I think priorities are some of those things that can not always match what strategically or in the long term is best for the organization. And that's kind of one of the things that I think we've talked about a lot in terms of you know, how can organizations make better decisions. And it is self-reflecting on what are the cultural variables that people are factoring into their choices? And are they the cultural variables that you want people to be thinking about when they're making these kind of decisions? I mean, 
like an example I would give is if you were thinking about, uh, you know, like a, like a Fortune 500 or some kind of financial firm, right? And they're making all these decisions. Are they thinking about, now you can say as an organization that you want them to be thinking about the, the stakeholders or you want them to be thinking about the, the people whose money is invested in these companies. But what if that organizational culture actually encourages making deals and being competitive with the guy next to you mm-hmm. to make sure that you get the promotion or you get that quarterly bonus or whatever it is, right? That is, it's those cultural norms and those co- the most poignant cultural factors that's what people are going to be thinking about when they start to make their decisions. Now, that's human decision-making process. But what you need from an organization is, is you need to know what they are and you need to make sure that they all align. We wrote a book in the, sorry, a chapter in the book we wrote was on um, conflict, team conflict, right? And a lot of it comes from this mismatch of values, right? Your individual values about what you think you should do clash with the organizational values of what the organization thinks you should do. And then if you're, putting a, if you're putting a decision and you have on, on one side what you think you should do, because what you want to do as a person and what you, you, know, you think you value, and on the other side, you have a decision of what you think the organization wants you to do for what the organization values as an organization, that is a, is a horrible position to be in. I'll give you, a, I'll give you a, an example. And this comes down to, I mean, what I think is one of the more formative decisions of, of, of the soldiers I interviewed. But there was this soldier... Um, who basically was was uh, operating a forward operating base, and basically he was there was a group of his of, of soldiers up in the mountain uh, being attacked by I think hundred maybe two hundred Taliban out there, and they basically asked him to put together you know a, a quick reaction force, so a small group of troops to go up there and help them out, help them repel. So that's exactly what he did. Got the guys together, left the base a bit unprotected, but knew the right decision, went up there and helped them, and uh, and and repelled the Taliban. And then another guy, his senior comes over to him and he basically says, you know, right, congrats, everyone. Thanks. Right. Everyone's basically beaten up. No ammo, no food, tired. I want you to now go into those mountains and get me my battle damage assessment. Right. How many bodies are there? Because my commander wants me to report how many bodies there were at this battle. And he told me, he said in a few seconds, he weighed up protecting everyone around him, which is what he as a person felt he's there to do and what the organization wanted him to do. And the army leader wanted him to do completely opposite. He said he weighed it up in about six seconds. And he said, I knew I was saying goodbye to my 20 year career. And I said, me and everyone on my side are driving back to base. See you later. And that, I mean, the the intestinal fortitude to make that decision still to this day, I mean, unbelievable. But that is that's from an organizational standpoint. That's not what you want. You don't want people deciding between the value they hold most dear and a value that you as an organization want them to be leveraging, because you'll get those situations where people will either A, sacrifice themselves to make the business decision, which will hurt them in the long run, resentment, trauma, whatever it is. It's not, it's not what you want people to be doing. Or B, they'll say two fingers to the organizational culture, and they'll make the decision that, that drives them. You know, ideally, you need some kind of alignment. You, know, you need people who have a value alignment with what the organization is giving them in order for them to make the decisions that you want them to make. Yeah, yeah this is fantastic. Love all of this. And uh, I think we could probably go on for for hours on this. One thing I, I'd like to be able to leave our listeners with are, you know, what, what can we take from this research, from what we know about decision making that can help leaders and everyday folks out there uh, do things a little bit better? I mean, that's a, that's a really good question. I, it's actually what... Um, it's one of the biggest challenges that that Lawrence and I have faced. And I know you mentioned earlier kind of our, our penguin book, but you know, we the, the pitch of that was we wrote conflict how soldiers make impossible decisions. And and you speak to people and everyone's like, Oh, I'm a terrible decision maker. Oh, I'd love I'd love to know more about that. And I mean, I use my own tactics in my own everyday life decisions. I use it to help my friends with their life decisions. So, you know, it's it's I think studying soldiers is great and studying high stakes situations is great, but it's this. The beauty of it is if you can understand how soldiers make and police and fire make unbelievably hard decisions in awful situations. Hell, we can help anyone make a decision if we can understand that. You know, it's kind of like the I think I think it's like the fitness world, right? If it trains the if it trains the US Army, it can train any any any, any everybody loves it, right? Anyone can be trained by it. It's the same with decision and it's the same with science. So I think when I was like, I think if I try and think about two fundamental lessons here, they all Almost come from the same place, but uh, I mean, Ben, you'll. 
I know that you've uh, you've got you've got your PhD, so you'll you'll appreciate this moment. But I remember I wrote mine. So mine was on the soldier of decision making work, all the interviews, did some research study, and I wrote you know three. I wrote seven chapters of, of basically empirical work, and I sat there and I thought, right, what I need to do is I need to take a week off. I need to relax, and I'm gonna I'm gonna reflect on this this process before I write my you know over aggrandized and egocentric conclusions where I claim I've solved all the world's problems. And, uh, <laughs> and I was on Instagram, right? And, and, and Chris Hemsworth has this, this probably paid advert for this book by a guy called Mark, uh, Mark Manson. And it was called The Subtle Art of Not Giving Up. And most people will, will recognize it, right? Bright orange cover, big black words, you know, it's very, very visible. And Chris Hemsworth was like, great book. And I was like, well, Thor recommends it. That's exactly what I'll read. So I get this book, right? Come, come, come through the mail. And I sit down and I'm reading it and I'm, I'm trying to take this time off. And I kid you not, in the first 10 pages, he had said every, he basically said my PhD, but he'd said it much better than I did and much cooler. Um, but he basically says these two, I think, fundamental lessons when we think about decision making. The first is, is basically, he, th- he said it's, it's called the kind of the, the backwards law, right? And it's a philosopher, Alan Watts. And I've got a philosophy friend, Nick Evans, who'll probably be very upset if I murder this one bit of philosophy. But what he basically said is that the desire for a positive experience is in itself a negative experience. And paradoxically, the acceptance of one's negative experience is a positive experience. And that, to me, just resonates with decision making. Because if you think about least worst decisions and just decisions in general in which you can't guarantee that everything's going to be fantastic right you have to accept it's going to suck and i mean guys you i mean you'll you'll know that kind of you know military military adage you know like embrace the suck right it's this idea you just got to accept that it's not going to be perfect and only once you've accepted that it isn't going to be great then can you work out what's the best thing i can do for me right and i mean like a big example of that. And personally, I think a big example of that at the moment is kind of, you know, COVID lockdown releases, right? We need to embrace the negative. If you, uh, if you, start, if you start to undo a lockdown, cases are going to go up and deaths are going to go up. But only by embracing and accepting the negative, the true reality of the situation, can we stri- try to make positive decisions. The opposite, right? This quest for the positive, I'm going to make everything brilliant. All that's going to do all that's going to do is create this like redundant deliberation because no option offers you pure, total positivity. And therefore, if your quest is this has to be the best ever, all I can do is show you why it won't be. And that's where you see, you know, there's this, um, this individual trait that we've kind of done some research on called maximization, right? This uh, old decision making theory, right? There are, sati- you, you, there are satisficing and there is maximizing. Satisficing is it's good enough, I'll be fine. Maximizing is I want the absolute best. Maximizers, worse at making decisions. They're less happy with their own decisions. They spend more time, all these things, right? Maximizing is, in the real world, it's okay if you want to buy a car, right? You want to make sure that your $8,000 gets you the best car with the low mileage and the, and the nicest heated seats. But in the real world, like a COVID lockdown release, you can't maximize that. But trying to maximize it, all that's going to do is lead to you know, redundant deliberation, delays, Status quo, that status quo bias. So I think that often we have to have a really tricky and I think honest conversation that things are going to suck. But what we're going to do is we're going to make the best decision that we can to have advanced the most positivity out of this that we can. And then the second part of that is then, okay, if everything's going to suck, right, some some bad things are going to happen. How do we make sure that the good thing that happens is the really important good thing? And this is where, so we, we wrote a paper on um, colliding sacred values. Tetlock's got his work on sacred and secular values. Um, and basically what, what Mark Monson, how he phrased it, which is, again, probably wouldn't get published, but it's, it's far more articulate, is basically he said that the goal of a good life is the art of not giving up. <laughs> but he clarifies that to say it's not about not giving up. That's called psychopathy, right? It's almost that thing you mentioned earlier, Chris, right? Not caring about a decision, right? That's mm-hmm. not good. He said, the art of not giving a f- is giving a f- about something so much that you don't give a f- about the adversity. And that's what we always talk about and we preach in our kind of research is that good decision making is about a very clear value hierarchy. 
One of the things that I, God, I remember being an absolute failure. Uh, my PhD was on uh, decision inertia in the military, right? So, so facing uncertain decisions, do they, do they succumb to decision inertia? Do they fall foul of decision avoidance? Do they get stuck in redundant deliberation? And I interviewed soldiers and they kept making decisions really quickly, like super tough decisions that we don't see in other cultures. And I was like, why? And the end of it, what I kind of identified was they have a very, very clear value structure. It goes one, two, three. And I'm not going to speak for all of them because there is individual difference, but it was, one guy said it first, he said, I had three priorities in this, protect my troops, complete the mission, protect civilians. And if you have one, two, three, you can normally make a decision. When people struggle to make decisions, it's because they have a tie at one and two. I want to do A, I want to protect the population. But at the same time, I need to protect myself. I want to go and make it the best I can out of this situation. But God, I can't, I can't be wrong. So when you have equal, equally important and opposing values, that's when people struggle. The people who make the best decisions, they can articulate one, two, three. And I've used that in my everyday life. My, um, my wife and I had a COVID wedding, right? So we were due a big, big shindig, New Orleans, May, hundreds of people flying over and, and COVID starts happening. And it's like, right, we have to make a least worst decision here. There's no good choices. What is our value hierarchy? What is the one thing that matters to us? And we sat there, we discussed it. We said, right, what matters to us is that we are married on May, on, uh, May 24th. It, was, it ended up being May 31st, but we get married, right? That's it. We can sacrifice the celebration. We can even sacrifice my mum being there, like my family being there. That, but this is the one value. And that's how, we, that's how we made our decision. And when we do trainings, that's what we teach, you know, goal-oriented decision-making or value-oriented decision-making. Articulate value one and yeah. then value two. Yeah, and I just want to really highlight how important, and this is something Chris and I have talked about on this podcast before, just from a leadership standpoint, how you absolutely have to know what your values are. What are your non-negotiables as a person? And, you know, to your point, Neil, I think once you have that in place, then you can start to apply those values and apply those principles to the decisions that you face and, and come out somewhere that's better than, than if you didn't have those. Yeah, people's behavior is monkey see, monkey do. Oh, okay. And they're like, okay, now I'm going to do this self-serving thing to get promoted, to move up, to move up. And then now they're executive level. Hey, man, you did all the chimpanzee behaviors in the right order. Congratulations. You got a Tesla charging during your day job. Uh and then you're like, well, now I got to make this strategy decision. It's not tactical anymore. Well, well, I'm in a new space that's not been decided before. How? I mean, they, they, with tears in their eyes, talk to Ben and I, Neil, and say, how yeah. will I decide? And I just want to slap them across the face. It's your values, you numb nut. Well, 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 how do I develop values? I mean, we brought a consultant in and we, we've got this plaque on the wall and it says uh, integrity and honesty and happiness, <laughs> you know, and you're... And it's like, dude, you've got to go get a moral education, right? You need to talk. You, you stand on the shoulders of giants with this stuff. There's a bunch of thinkers. I'm not going to say just, I come out of the Western canon tradition. I love that. I'm not super familiar with some of the stuff out of the East, but like you can, if you don't know what the great books are, you got to get plugged in guys, because you've worked yourself on out onto a plank of values that you are not equipped. Who cares that you can make a sexy PowerPoint or crash all the freaking Excel <laughs> models and and look good in a suit? I mean, I haven't figured out how to pull that one off, but you got all this stuff and now your values. And this is what's so great about what Neil's saying as I go on this rant at our listeners is these values are the way you make decisions that are hard and ambiguity with uncertain outcomes and all that kind of stuff. There's not some like, Oh, well, I followed the ABC one, two, three, because if you're getting to where the cool stuff in life is and in individual relationships, raising your kids, going out, being a police officer every day, helming the ship of an enterprise in the business environment, all the cool stuff is out there on the fringe. You know, who wants to say it's like, well, how was your life? Well, I applied all the rules correctly and completely copacetically. I mean, it sounds like, I mean, maybe there's some guy, if there's a guy out there that's lived that way and figured out how to do it and is happy, hey, I'm not raining on your parade, buddy. But a lot of the people that listen to this show are really trying to do something. And and if you want to do something cool, you got to get your, ah, your values straight. 
I'm, I'm glad you. I'm glad you went on a rant there because I feel like I've been talking a lot this entire time. So I feel like my voice is probably getting monotonous. Well, you're smarter but, than us too. Nah, Will, so. No way. <laughs> but, but, but it's interesting because so we actually did this. Um, we started doing this um, work recently. There was, there was a chapter in the book, and then actually Matt and I started writing some work about one of the things that I noticed was that the that people these decisions people made right these least worst decisions they always. They always had one and it was, it was always very formative to them and their identity. And so we started exploring, you know, well, what happens if these decisions go wrong? What happens if you just make a decision that's against your values? And we got really into a lot of the literature around kind of moral injury in, in, in um, moral injury in servicemen. And that is defined as a value transgression. And so we were talking about we started writing about stuff like COVID, right? It's forcing doctors to make decisions that fundamentally violate the value of, you know, do no harm, protect of, of, you know, saving lives and stuff. And so what I always say to people is you have to know your values and be guided by your values, because if you make a decision that violates your values because you prioritize someone else's values, you are the one that's going to suffer that. And I mean, there are, you know, I'm not saying every decision, but the extreme decisions that truly test your values. That that's the link that we're seeing with a lot of people about kind of, you know, moral injury, trauma and just struggling to 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 live with the decisions that they've made. And that's as important as making a decision is being able to make it be OK with the outcome, good or bad and live with it. And a lot of that comes to being guided by your values. It's almost I think Ricky Gervais said it once a long time ago, and I probably took it far too literally. But he basically said, I'm Darwinian. I am who I am. I'm going to be me. And I will either survive or die. I will be successful or I will not be successful. And sometimes I think that, you know, we, we have to do that. We have to know what our values are, know what's important to us and be driven by it and stick to it. And I think organizations need to do that. Organizations need to be true to their values and be guided by them. And I think people need to do the same things. But it, it, it's self-reflective. It's in a situation where everything sucks. Truly, what is the one thing, like you said, Ben, the non-negotiable, Chris, the non-negotiable. But we have to know that and be clear and then be be so confident in it that we don't give a fuck about all the adversity that follows because we stuck to the most important thing. Yeah, I run into these guys, these execs, there's hollowed out and it's because they've just, well, I just went with what the organization that, you know, the survival mentality. And they're yep. like, why, why, do, why does life not have any color or zest to it? Where, where am I? Who am I? Uh, I'm having a midlife crisis, which... I'm trying to paper over the hole in my heart with Ferraris and hot babes, you know, <laughs> and it, it's it's ridiculous. And but then some people, they just really haven't had this foundational moral education. Right. And so, you know, the humanities wasn't a big part. They hadn't thought about or maybe come up through an organization that teaches some morality, like, say, Boy Scouts or something mm. like that. Um and so they're like, hey, I, there's something here, but I need to come up with some values. And that soul searching doesn't happen. You can't do that in a two hour session at church on Sunday, one Sunday. And you can't do that in a two hour yoga sweat retreat. You can't do it at that peyote sweat lodge. This yeah. is a process that has to unfold as you are having that dialogue internally with yourself and reflecting on some situational scenarios to kind of test drive in your mind, you know, doing the work of crisis without the crisis, right? Mm -hmm. Really having your thinking cap on. Well, well this is, we, we just wrote a paper um, coming out soon called Foretellers of Doom. And basically it's that in, order, in, in training, you need to train people with, you know, these rare, unforeseeable, you know, you need to be creative in the challenges that you pose people. Because the thing about values, I think, often is you don't really know what they are until you violate one. Like you really don't know what truly matters to you until you find out that it truly matters to you. And in order to do that, you need to have experience. You need to, you know, you need to go through the process. And it's one of the things that we talk about in terms of organizational decision making is people practice the RPD stuff a lot. They practice the policy stuff a lot. They don't practice the least worst decisions a lot. So I said, you know, all these soldiers going out there. Phenomenal. Trained so well. All the all the mission rehearsals, everything down to a T. They have never been trained to make a to make a choice. And so when they're presented with one, they're like, oh, this is this is something I don't normally do. How do I do this? 
And it's like, that's the kind of, we need to train people in these skills to face situations where they are juggling things that are all very important to them and a lot of other people. And how do they go through that, identify the most important one, make the decision, defend the decision and reflect on the decision. Man, I'm so glad you brought up that violation piece because mm. that's part of our practicing. There's no skill, like making moral decisions. Like you're not going to bat a thousand, right? You're, you're going to miss a couple. Yep. And it's that missing and sitting with that unsatisfaction, that dissonance between who you want to be and who you were in that moment that helps teach you those lessons to solidify. But one of the interesting things is our society doesn't have a way for moral redemption. No, not at the moment. Right. And so if somebody's like, I, I biffed it, How, you know, or they have to gesticulate in such a massive, massive way to get back in social good graces, because it's that, like you said, the attribution error, outcomes, all those kinds of things. But if the best literature that man has ever written, humanity's ever written, is like this redemption process, right? Mm -hmm. Like if people are with the Judeo-Christian values, that's a whole thing that Christ came so that you might redeem yourself, you, that you've, you've actually have this magical forgiveness that allows you to have another at bat. But if we look at it from a pedagogical perspective, everything's about learning, right? Yep. And you're going to make some of these moral failures. But And again, I think from an organizational standpoint, if you know that you're one and done, like if you know that you can, you can't, you can only make one wrong decision and then it's game over. How much is that going to change your decision making process? Because now you're now you're defensive, right? You're you're always primed to be avoidant. And that was that study I mentioned to you um, when we were prepping for this, right? We we recently um, did a study with soldiers where we put them in higher levels of command, and they got more avoidant. And I, I spoke to it goes against everything from the social psych lit. But when I spoke to Lawrence about it, he was like, yeah, I'm not surprised. He was like, all the naturalistic work we do, put people in command and they become more avoidant. They become more error averse. And that, that's a cultural thing. That's a fear of a chance for redemption. It's a, if I'm wrong, I feel it and it's game over for me. Yeah, that's the whole golden parachute thing for CEOs, yeah. right? Oh, because if you, if you flame out, even though you've got a board of directors that you're resonating your decisions with, even though you got all this stuff, they're going to hang you in the public forum. And that's where you're just like, well, since I'll never work again, I need like 5 million bucks to chill out in Aspen for a while, right? Because I'm done. I, I don't yeah. get another CEO at bat unless I start an org on my own. Yeah. yeah. So when they make their decisions, they're going to be thinking about, right, what decision gets me in the least trouble with the board of directors in the morning? Not maybe what's best for the company, not maybe what's best for the people. What decision puts me at least personal risk? And maybe 90% of the time, that decision is the right decision. But they're 10%, that decision is not going to align with what the right course of action was. Right. I think that's why I, that's why I like studying decisions, to be honest. I think it gets, I, I think they're very, very complicated to start to say. I, I think the idea that there are good and bad decisions, it, it, it opens up a can of worms. I mean, as, as you can see that we've gone on for <laughs> at least 90 minutes about, and I don't think we've got an answer yet. So, <laughs> right. But what, so just to summarize, so when we, we always wrap up our episodes with advice and we're going to talk about organizational advice here in a second, but for individuals and for leaders, it's the same thing. You got to have some daggone value, guys. And that's, that doesn't come easy. If you want great responsibility and a place to live and a place to exist in a psychologically healthy place, morals and values that you explore and develop on your own, right? So awesome. Now let's talk about organizations. So if you have a control of an organization or you can shape things and stuff within their culture and that kind of stuff, what do we want to think with this decision-making literature some implications for organizations that maybe want to do this better or empower their people to? So I, I think from the organizational standpoint, I kind of break it down into, I think there's two issues to think about. I think in terms of an applied issue, the first is this idea of culture, right? And, and, and reflecting on how does our organizational culture trickle into the decision-making process? And so from the, some of the early work I did was on kind of the, the US Army adaptation around civilian casualties, right? And that had, I think, obviously, that had really benevolent intention, right? You know, General Stanley McChrystal, what, are we get, what don't we understand? We're not going to win a war if we don't stop killing fucking civilians, right? Great quote. But he basically said it, and then he changed the whole policy, right? When that trickles down, 
that then manifests itself in a situation where soldiers feel that they can't do the actions that they need to do to save themselves and their men and women because they're worried about violating this strategic level command. Right. That's not a good recipe for operational success now because you've created a value conflict down there. And a lot of the soldiers I interviewed expressed that exact thing. Sometimes they said, I knew it and I did it anyway. Sometimes they said, I didn't know what to do. Yeah, we cut but our you... missions in half. We stopped exactly. rolling out of the fob. Yeah. That... Exactly. So sometimes a organizational culture or value, you need to interpret and understand how that's going to manifest in different types of situations and just identify what are those situations that are really going to put stress on that value. Mm. And then how can we either help the people make it in terms of can we do we do we talk about when that value needs to be maybe moved down, maybe it needs to be seconded, or how can we help in terms of letting people know that if they do break that value or make a decision that's in violation of that value, you know, that's okay if it's the right decision, right? But they, there has to be a reflection on what the organizational values are and an understanding of what that does to the decision-making process. And I think we have to, and not just the organizational values, I think if you're talking about big businesses and you're talking about public facing businesses so police fire all these things you also have to think about the you know the the public culture and what that culture looks like because that's going to come into the decision making too and this is something that Lawrence I mean Lawrence has been studying this for years with terms of UK police UK fire you know when they make decisions you know they're thinking about the organization and the organizational values but they're also thinking about you know public reaction accountability and so I think organizations need to be transparent around what the factors are that people are juggling, because you can't judge and blame someone for their decision making if you don't anticipate and understand the kind of factors that they're going to be considering and the impact that that's going to have on what they do. And the second thing, and this is a very, we haven't really talked about this, but, but I, I think that it's a personnel issue for organizations, you know. There are people who have certain personality traits that make them slightly better at making hard decisions. And anyone who's had a boss, and I like guys I've interviewed, people we've worked with, Chris, I'm sure you've got your own yeah, stories, but gosh. you know, you, there are good decision makers and bad decision makers. There are decisive people and there are indecisive people. There are even two decisive people. Uh, the, the quarterback analogy I always give, right? You, you know, you don't want a quarterback who gets the ball and immediately just makes the two yard pass every single time because he's scared to hold on to the ball and he's scared to take, he's scared to let the play develop. You also don't want a quarterback who holds the ball, is scared to make the pass in case there's an interception and lets the play develop and holds onto it too long that he's sacked, right? Kind of a Goldilocks model here. Different personality traits lend you to each of those, experience lends you to each of those, right? So there's a personnel issue in terms of you do need to think about the kind of the science of what a, ideal decision maker is like we found we did a study recently in which we compared um police officers with military experience to police officers without military experience and we found this thing that, that we kind of called a, a foxtrot thinking that police officers who had military experience are set were slower to assess the situation so they took longer to listen to the scenario cognitively cognitively kind of interpret the scenario and then move on to a decision making phase but when they did move on they made the decisions faster. They were faster at every single stage. Picked the choice faster, committed to it faster, and submitted it faster. And so there's interesting nuances in the way different people make decisions. And I think organizations need to sometimes think about that. You know, you don't want people in leadership who are scared to make the decision. Right. You don't want people in leadership who are scared to not make the decisions, right? Good decision making is as much about not making a decision too fast as it is about making a decision way too slow. And there is, we're kind of unpacking it a bit, but there are, you know, there are decent indicators around what good decision makers are. And I mean, the one that we've looked at the most is, yeah, maybe you don't want a maximizer, right? If you, if you have people who, who handle uncertainty every day, who have to choose between crap options every day, maybe you don't want someone who needs it, who needs everything to be okay. Maybe you need the realist in there right. who says, it's going to suck. But I've got a challenge, a challenge orientated mentality, and I'm going to make it the best it can possibly be, knowing that it sucks. Man, that is so good. So, just reflecting on the organization stuff, you culture just plays so much of a piece on this. Um, if you punish somebody for a bad outcome, 
without a review of their process, nobody's going to make a decision again. They're going to exactly. push it, push it as far as way. So an assessment, the kind of people you have in there makes a difference for you. So, man, we've covered so much territory today. Um, we've talked about what is a decision and making hard decisions. We talked about some models for that. Uh, we talked about some current applications to events like firefighting, policing, business. And then we talked to, uh, about individuals, leaders, and orgs, some implications for them. Anything else, Neil, that, that you want to throw out there? I mean, for, well, we'll talk about where, where can they find you on the web if they want to find you? Um, I would say uh, I'm on Twitter, uh, where I kind of uh, where some of our work is. Um, NeilShortland.com, uh, although I actually need to update that. That'd be... That might be a good place to start. I, I would say if anyone's interested, I'd go on um, uh, it's ground-truth.co.uk and I can give you the link to it. But that's where um, Lawrence and I, that's where we put most of our stuff that we do for the kind of the organizations out there. So any of the work we've done for, you know, real life businesses, you know, where we kind of look at their decision making uh, and, and things like that. And that's kind of our, our kind of applied front. Um, and then I, you know, the, if anyone's interested, you know, if you want to read the science of it, you know, I, 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 the conflict book is the, is the favorite thing I've ever written. Um, but in, uh, maybe in maybe early next year, you know, Lawrence and I are going to be putting out a book for everyone, you know, kind of on, on the lessons that we've learned and how anyone from, from relationship decisions to business decisions, to personal decisions, how you can kind of learn from this and, and try and seize opportunities because like, I don't, I don't say it lightly. Anderson got it right in 2003. We, we love avoidance. We lo if there's a hard choice, we will, we will try everything we can to not make it. And so everyone can just do better and be better if we can overcome those hurdles and actually begin to commit in the face of uncertainty and commit in the face of fear. Excellent. Anything else you want to add that we didn't cover in this episode? God, no, I think, I think, I think you, I think you had, you had everything I know. <laughs> <laughs> we mowed the lawn. Well, everybody, thank you, Neil, for being on this podcast. Um, everybody do check out his links. They'll be in the show notes. And once again, thank you for such a high quality conversation around decisions. No, oh, thanks guys for having me. Thank Matt, thanks, Matt Crane for the recommendation. I'll ask him if he regrets it, but uh, no, Chris, it's, it's been a joy. Thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you, Ben. Thanks for listening to the Indigo podcast. If you like this podcast, please consider helping us by rating us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, telling your friends about us, having us on your podcast, or mentioning us on social media. Our website is www.indigopodcast.com, where you can access more information about us and this episode. Thanks again, and we look forward to talking with you again soon.